Welcome to Strictly Money at the News Forum, where all voices matter. I'm Sajal Patel. Saving for retirement is a daunting task for many Canadians. So if you have access to an employer-sponsored retirement plan, then consider yourself lucky, because these plans can take some of the retirement saving burden off your shoulders. However, the problem that I see time and time again is that a large segment of the workforce doesn't understand the type of plan they have. They confuse a defined benefit plan with a defined contribution plan. They don't know what they're invested in or even know how to invest. They're not clear on the fees they're paying. And there are many who believe they can invest their money themselves and outperform professional pension managers. These misconceptions are putting many Canadians at risk of outliving their retirement nest egg. That's why I'm so glad to have Randy Boslow on the show today. Randy's a top rank pension lawyer and partner at McCarthy Tetro, and he's here to set the record straight with respect to employer-sponsored pension plans. Randy, thanks for coming on Strictly Money. Well, thank you for having me. So let's kick things off with the difference between defined benefit and defined contribution plans. Which one gives the bigger bang for the buck? Well, defined benefit plans give a lot bigger bang for the buck. Uh, pretty much uh, for every dollar you put into one of these plans, you're going to get twice as much out of a DB plan than you get out, out of a defined contribution plan. By DB plan, I mean defined benefit. And a defined benefit plan, just for the record, is one in which the benefits you get in retirement is defined. So I'm going to get a pension of $100 a month. Uh, whatever it costs, the employer has to pick that up. In a defined contribution plan, I put I, I have a defined amount that I put into a plan, like an RRS. It works like an RSP. I put the defined amount in, and then my pension is whatever that happens to grow to when I'm ready to retire. So here's what's interesting, because we saw this huge shift between um, from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans. And the thinking was that defined contribution plans were more cost effective. But you're saying that's not the case. No, that's that's definitely not the case. Um, defined benefit plans are a much more cost efficient way of providing a bigger, better pension at retirement than defined contribution. The reason for the shift is in a single employer pension plan environment where there's only one employer in the plan, the defined benefit plan poses sometimes fatal financial risks for the employer because it's it's the one that has to make sure there's enough money to pay those defined benefits. In a defined contribution plan, the employer just puts so much in every month or every week and boom, it's done. That's all it has to do. So Randy, can we go through some, some of the reasons for it? Like, I've read about longevity risk pooling. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is this is where, in this case, defined benefit plans only have to fund to an average life expectancy. Um, that's not necessarily the case with defined contribution plans. Can you explain that? Yep, yep. So longevity risk is really, um, I know at age 65, uh, my likelihood is I will live to age 82. That's that's what, on average what I would live to. So I need to have enough money to get me to age 82 if I was averaging myself with everybody else. But in my own particular circumstances, I feel I'm a, you know, a 65-year-old. I'm in great health. Maybe I'll live to 90 or 100. So I really need to be cautious if I'm saving for my own retirement, not getting it from a defined benefit plan. I got to put enough away so I will have money coming in until I think I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. Whereas when the employer is funding the DB plan, it just takes a look at the average and says, well, as long as I'm funding on average for everybody at age 82, every male at 82, I've got enough money in the plan. And that, and so that makes it much more efficient because you're basically just averaging all those ages out. And one of the things about, um, I guess, the benefit of defined benefit plan, at least from what I've seen, is, is when it's professionally managed and you have a pool of money, you also can leverage the economies of scale, can you not? Oh, yeah. And that's where, like when I mentioned this, uh, you know, it's, it's you're going to get twice as much money out of a defined benefit plan as a defined contribution plan. Almost half of that comes out of lower investment management fees and a higher level of investment management skill. In a defined contribution plan, typically employees are given a choice. So it's a do it yourself retirement arrangement. Whereas in a defined benefit plan, you've got expert professionals who are managing the money, one big pool of money that's going to apply to everybody over a long period of time. And so they get better fees. The, and even if they just get 1% lower than what you're getting from your fund, over 20 years, that, that could make a 25, 30% difference 
in the amount of total money saved. Right. It's that big a deal. That 1% matters that much over the long term. Okay. Hold your thought, Randy, because I want to continue this uh, conversation right after this break. Welcome back. I'm here with Randy Bosla of McCarthy Tetro. Randy, before the break, we were talking about the cost effectiveness of DB plans versus DC or defined contribution plans. Um, I want to pick up on that and talk specifically about asset allocation. Which one fares better and why? Yeah, now that's another aspect of this that saves you another 10 to 12% between defined benefit and defined contribution. But what is it? Um, asset allocation is about how you allocate your money as between, say, stocks or bonds. Stocks are more a little bit more risky, but you get a bit better return. And bonds, they're very, they're much more guaranteed. And but the but you're going to get a rate of interest that's a lot lower, so the performance is going to look a little lower. Now, when you're younger, um, you know you can take more risks. So you might have more stocks than bonds. But as you get older, you're generally advised to put more money in bonds and less in risky stocks. Um, so if I'm investing for myself in a defined contribution plan, I've got to do that based on my age. But if I'm in a defined benefit plan, I just take a look at what the average age is for the whole plan and I allocate my assets between the two, which means I probably got a lot more stocks than bonds. It might be like 60% stocks and 40% bonds. So I'm going to get that uptake in return. And that's another reason why defined benefit plans are so much more cost effective than defined contribution plans. So, Randy, the way that um, I think the financial industry has has tried to solve this is is introduce these target dated funds, right? Or some people call it lifestyle funds, where um, you invest based on your retirement date, and then they naturally they they change the asset allocation uh, more towards bonds. Um, what what are, what are your thoughts on those? Well, I, th I think they're doing just what I said. They're just, instead of you having to think, I'm getting older, so I better take less risk in my investment portfolio, they're going to do that for you, so I don't have to think about it. But the, the bottom line is, and I mean the bottom financial line, is that I'm going to be in more bonds than stocks as I get older, so I'm not going to be getting that average rate of return I would get if I, if I was in a, if, uh, that, that a defined benefit plan would, would get. So I'm going to do uh, not as well for me, myself individually, as I could do, or as the plan will do in a defined benefit environment. I mean, I, in a defined benefit plan, I don't get the advantage of these investment returns. It's just that it's a much more cost-efficient arrangement. So if I'm in a defined benefit plan that requires employee contributions, those contributions can be less and still be providing way more than the contributions are providing in a DC plan. So some way, shape, or form, I'm gonna benefit, the employer's gonna benefit, and being in a defined benefit plan, I'm going to have a lot more certainty about what my pension actually is going to be when I get to age 65. Whereas if I'm in a defined contribution plan, I just got to hope to goodness that things work out for me. Because uh, if, if I'm not getting the performance I think I should be getting, I might have to adjust my expectations to something somewhat lower. I, I don't expect the average person to understand this, but surely the financial industry understands the cost effectiveness of this plan. So why do you think we've made this shift to, towards defined contribution plans? Is it simply that they just don't want to take the funding risk? Because we know, especially since the great financial crisis and low interest rates and people living longer, there is a bigger burden for, for pension plan sponsors, isn't there? Yes, exactly right. And in a defined benefit plan where the employer is on the hook to make sure there's enough money ultimately to pay those pensions, it can pose fatal financial risks for those employers. For example, uh, the steel industry, as it was sort of turning downwards, um, we saw a lot of failures in the steel industry and we saw a lot of uh, that failure was attributable to the huge liabilities they had to fund in their pension plans. Uh, Nortel is another example. It was just, you know, wrong economy, wrong time for them and their big historic plan. So uh, it posed a, that that plan itself posed a financial risk to them that caused in part caused them to go under. Um, the good news on that is I just want to say that our pension rules 
uh, made it such that uh, all employees, even in those bankruptcy situations, still in Nortel received as much as 90% or more of what they were promised. So it's not like they went in the tank with Nortel. Yeah. They still received some pretty good pension payouts. And Stelco as well. Stelco as well. They've reorganized a couple of times, and a lot of that that had to do with the pressure being put on the business by the cost um, the cost of their pension program. Okay, um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to get your thoughts on an article that you wrote about DC uh, plans and uh, investor choice. We'll take a quick commercial. <laughs> Welcome back to Strictly Money. I'm here with Randy Bosla, a pension expert and partner at McCarthy Tetro. Uh, Randy, I want to turn to an article that you wrote. Um, this is about investment choice with defined contribution plans. And the point that you make in this is that it's risky from a, a legal perspective and a financial performance perspective. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um... So a lot of people seem to think, or a lot of employers seem to think that if I give employees choice and then they screw up their financial planning for the future, that's their problem, not mine. Uh, wrong. <laughs> Once you give choice, then you've got a whole host of fiduciary duties that come into play. So once I've gone, once I've, if I don't give any choice, my only, my only duty is to manage reasonably the assets that are under my control and my employees will then get whatever that performance results in in their, in their accounts in the DC plan. But once I give choice, wow, now I've got to think about, um, uh, do I am I giving enough choice that will respond to what the members need to achieve their own personal goals? Um, do, I, um, do I understand what the risk tolerances are of my members? Do my members understand their own risk tolerances? So now I have a duty to sort of educate them about what their risk tolerances are. And then I've got a duty to educate them about the risk characteristics of the choices that they have so that they're able to go away and match up those investment choices with their own personal risk tolerances. And then I've got to make sure that each of the funds uh, I'm not paying too much for because there's been lawsuits around employers inadvertently getting consumer funds rather than, you know, at retail rates rather than, uh, wholesale rate funds, if I can put it that way, that are in their plans, or the, the costs start to creep up and the employer hasn't has sort of been asleep at the monitoring switch and hasn't noticed that and they get sued about that. So they need to monitor that. They need to monitor the communication that's going from the managers directly to their employees where they put those in place to make sure that those aren't overstating things or overselling or selling them other products that maybe uh, their members don't really need or want or the employer didn't know what was going on. So there's all kinds of duties. There's, a, there's something called the Canadian Association of Pension Supervisory Authorities, and they publish guidelines. And one of the guidelines is about um, member choice defined contribution plans. And everybody seems to think that that guideline applies to all defined contribution plans. But if you read, I think it's either the first paragraph or the second paragraph, it says, if you, it's only if you're giving two or more choices to members in your DC plan that you need to comply with this guideline. Otherwise, all you gotta do is just manage things reasonably. So yeah, there's a lot more legal risk associated with giving choice. So Randy, this is very interesting because you mentioned the financial education piece. Um, I have seen personally time and time again that employ employees don't understand um, what they're investing in or even how to create a portfolio. And, and a lot of times they're not financially educated. So what, it's, what sort of legal obligation then does a sponsor have? Is it, is it enough to say, here's a 30-page handout on how your pension plans work? Uh, here's a list of funds. See you later? Uh, no. <laughs> they, it, of course, they need to do a bit more than that. Yeah. Um, but the, the reality is that most of the people who are in DC plans, they don't, they don't make a choice. Something like 80% of people just go into the a fund that is selected as the default uh, for members who don't make choices or who don't want to make choices. Mm. Uh, so they're not actively managing their plan. They're just going into what the employer has set as the default. 
And in recent years, those target date or target funds that you mentioned earlier, they tend to be the default. So if I'm in an age category um, of you know, 40 to 45, I'm going to go into the 40 to 45 target date fund as my default if I don't give the employer any instructions. Now, that doesn't relieve the employer from going back and figuring out why they didn't get any instructions from this person, uh, because maybe that got lost in the mail or something. So they still have a fiduciary duty to follow up and not just assume that the person is in the default fund because um, they want to be. Yeah, we only have about 45 seconds for the break, but um, also with the flexibility, there is the unintended consequences, and and that is a lot of employers are not contributing enough um, and and aren't experts at investing. Yep. Um, I mean, it uh, it takes a lot, like, in order to save, to replace the income you have now uh, in retirement and and to maintain your standard of living, you pretty much need to be saving about 18% of your earnings if you're a middle or high income earner. And if you're not saving that much, then you better lower your expectations for retirement. Right. If you are a lower income worker, because of our social uh, programs and other sorts of things, you probably don't have to save as much. Okay. But um, it's, it's more aimed at middle and upper income earners. 18%, good rule right. of thumb, that's what I need to save. Welcome back to Strictly Money. Um, Randy, as someone who looks very closely at the pension uh, landscape, uh, not just in Canada, but I know uh, in the U.S. as well, what's what's one step that you would like to see employers take to, to help their workforce? Well, an easy one is if you're going to provide a BC, a defined contribution plan, think about not giving investment choice to individuals. Mm. Once you've given that choice, it's kind of hard to take it away. But if you're going in that direction, think about not giving choice. About 3% of registered pension plans that are defined contribution in this country don't give choice. The rest do for the reasons I explained earlier. The other thing is look at multi-employer plans. Uh, The unions have these multi-employer plans and they provide great benefits uh, for plan members. There are other multi-employer plans that employers can join. One of them, curiously enough, is called the Saskatchewan Pension Plan. It's really like a giant group RSP, and you can join as an employer. And uh, basically, you're you're joining a not-for-profit investment management uh, group that has expert investment management. Uh, so that's something worth exploring. Another one would be to try to get into a defined benefit plan that is a multi-employer plan. And we've got some of these world-famous so-called Maple Leaf pension plans, like the CAT pension plan, the, the Colleges of Applied Arts and Technology pension plan has opened itself up to the broader private sector. And as an employer, you can just apply and join it. And you get all the benefits of a defined benefit plan with actually the same benefits you get out of a defined contribution plan, which is that your contributions as an employer are going to be limited to a fixed amount. Uh, and you get the advantage of a defined benefit, all the cost savings I mentioned earlier. Um, and your employees get the certainty of a lifetime pension that is probably going to be twice as much for the same money you're spending on pension. Um, Opsu Trust offers another uh, plan of that sort. There are some private pl- providers that are starting to come on stream, like Blue Pier. But the idea is if you can collaborate in a multi employer environment, um, that is a great vehicle for moving forward. And that is the heart and soul of why jurisdictions like um, the Netherlands. And some of the Norwegian countries do so well because their plans are basically industry-wide plans, not these single employer plans. That's really interesting. So do you have to be an employer? You can be self-employed, an entrepreneur as well to participate? Well, because of our tax rules, um, I mean, I I was able to join. I I operate my law practice through a professional corporation. And my professional corporation was able to join the CAT plan as an employer. And so now I finally, after 35 years of being in the pension industry, I've been able to join uh, a defined benefit plan. And uh, so not everybody, it's just not like signing up for an RSP. Right. You've got to have an employer that is a, a legal entity that joins. And then um, you've got to, it's got to be this employer-employee relationship. So with my professional corporation, I'm the employee. It is the employer. 
So it was able to join and I get to benefit from that. Right, and we only have about 45 seconds until the end of the show. Um, how do you see the corporate pension landscape play out in the next, say, decade? Well, I think there's going to be an appreciation that maybe there's something to look at in terms of these multi-employer defined benefit arrangements. And also, I think there's going to be more product that is going to come online on a multi-employer basis, whether that's defined contribution or defined benefit. And it's really that collaboration and that pooling of resources that really gets you ahead financially. And as I say, if you got your druthers, go with something that looks more like defined benefit because it's way more cost efficient. Yeah, very um, interesting stuff and a, and a lot of great points that you've made. I think uh, a lot of the viewers are going to be appreciating what you had to say when it comes to their own retirement uh, security and planning. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, Randy. Thanks again for having me. Randy Boslow of McCarthy Tetro. If you're unsure about the type of pension plan you have, or if you feel that you're not being supported, either through the right financial education or getting information that's more transparent, I urge you to speak to your company plan sponsor or your human resources department. Your retirement security is on the line, and the sooner you know where you stand, the easier it is to course correct if you need to do that, or you may be pleasantly surprised at how far you've progressed. Once again, if you have some thoughts, feedback, or questions about today's show, send us an email. I'd love to hear from you. Until then, stay well, stay wise, and stay wealthy. Thanks for watching.